Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 208. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King, Lord, we turn to you once again like we always do during this time um, in uh, preparation to be blessed and refreshed by what you're going to be showing us by way of your word. Thank you for preserving your words. Thank you for pouring out your spirit who reminds us of the words of the Master, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. Uh, Thank you for um, uh, giving us this opportunity to prepare ourselves and our hearts for not just daily living and the things that we have to deal with on on an everyday basis, but to also prepare us for uh, things that are shortly to um, transpire as we take a look at end-time prophecy and continue to talk about these topics, um, as well as um, the topic of... um, of, uh, apologetics where we're talking about trinity issues in the in the later segments thank you lord for these um um exciting times that we're living in although they can be frightful if we are not prepared so that's why we pray that you will give us a heart to continue to trust in you and realize that as long as our hope is anchored in who messiah is what he's done for us and the his daily intense love for us and we're continuing to say no to sin and to turn away from the flesh and to say yes to yeshua and the holy spirit as long as we're prepping ourselves with with um, feeding our feeding on the word and um, maintaining a healthy relationship to the body of Messiah, forgiving one another, um, seeking an opportunity to witness, Lord, there's this general sense of um, we don't even really need to worry about anything that's that's coming down the pike. Uh, it's because um, our faith is anchored in the one who has uh, uh, overcome. All of those things, and he's that rock that our house is built upon. And therefore, when the when the storm comes, we won't be tossed to and fro. Our house won't collapse as if it were built on sand. Indeed, it will stand and withstand the storms because it's founded on the rock, and his name is Messiah. So, thank you for that. Continue to um, challenge us with these studies, and uh, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory of Hashem Yeshua. O Maine. These are the live internet studies. My name is Ari Ben Lyman Hana V. This is segment one, the hour long part of eschatology, an end time study, uh, a biblical study of end time events. Let's jump right back into where we left off. You can see on my screen right now, I've got this chart of scriptures pulled up from the Tanakh as well as the Apostolic Scriptures. And we're working our way down through kind of looking at some of them. Obviously, there's too many of them, me, too many of them for me to actually read all of them. We would be in this study for months and months just reading the scriptures. If that's if that were the case, we would lose sight of the big picture of trying to look at the book of Revelation, which we're kind of building towards. So instead, what I've been doing is I've been selectively reading and highlighting some passages that I feel are uh, necessary for us to get a running start as we dive into the book of Revelation, particularly passages that have this concept of God's dealings with Israel and God's dealings with the surrounding nations as they interact with Israel, particularly um, the um, uh, the judgments and the blessings and um, the punishments and as well as the the, um, the establishment of the kingdom of God that's uh, to come on planet earth someday. And so, the way we do that is we go through the Tanakh and work our way towards the Apostle Scriptures, in other words, culminating in our study on the book of Revelation. This really is a study on the book of Revelation. We're just going to go through some uh, older passages. I also introduced this concept um, either last week or the week prior. I'll just flash this on the screen right now. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. No, we're not studying the book A Tale of Two Cities. I'm just borrowing this theme that I've seen other um, prophecy teachers use, and I thought it was kind of very clever for my own perspective, that when we finally get to the book of Revelation, we're going to find that there's this showdown, kind of a smackdown, as you were. I'll put a little graphic on the screen that shows this. A smackdown between these two primary cities in the earth that are going to be the kind of the last two standing, last two major survivors, as it were, in this um, cosmic battle between light versus dark and good versus bad, you know, good versus evil, righteousness versus evil. And those two cities are Babylon and Jerusalem. And so we can have all kinds of discussions like we are going to eventually on who is Mystery Babylon who is eschatological Israel? What roles are they pl- going to be playing in the end time events? And why is it important for us? Will we even be alive and around during those times? Um, I'm of the impression that we will be alive and around. Well, let me say it this way. 
that the church will be around. Uh, I don't know if I will be around then. It depends on how close I think we are on the timetable, but we should be um, uh, able to perceive um, the importance of these two great cities. Now, the part that makes it a little challenging today is that Jerusalem is somewhere I can pinpoint on the map, and so is Babylon. And last time I checked, both of them have populations of over a million, both of those large cities. But there's going to be some importance that both of these cities play when it comes to the um, new world order that's established by this figure known as Antichrist, who, of course, is a satanically inspired um, individual uh, that's going to hit the scene if he's not already alive today. And so this tale of two cities is important for us, even from a spiritual perspective today, even if we don't see the mag the magnitude of of Jerusalem's end time role right now or Babylon's end time role. The idea that um, Spiritually speaking, the influence that ancient Babylon has had on the world today in, in terms of world religions and uh, um, um, man-made uh, 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 spiritual practices and things like that is well documented. I, don't, I shouldn't have to explain that to you how ancient Babylon, we're talking about Nimrod's Babylon, by the way, goes all the way back, you know, thousands of years, even predating any Israel or people like that. Uh, Satan has had his hooks in the nations, deceiving them with the, with his I idolatry, his his false uh, religions, um, his um, uh, uh, spirit spiritism. You know his wickedness. His it it covers the earth today. It's no secret. Um, but where's Jerusalem going to fit into all that? So that's why we're working towards this idea of a tale of two cities, or humorously, a tale of two kitties. Yeah, I couldn't resist when I saw this. Uh, uh, a thumbnail when I Google search the Tale of Two Cities. So, Tale of Two Kitties. As you already know, we've already talked about, introduced this idea of Day of the Lord in the book of Revelation, which is a theme that's already borrowed from the Old Testament. The Day of the Lord is this coming time period on planet Earth. If, if you're taking the futurist perspective like I do, um, the Day of the Lord, even if you take the Preterist position where everything already have already happened in the first century, the, f the, f the full Preterist position, um, you still have this day of the Lord time period, which is this intense time of God's judgment and wrath that's poured out upon the wickedness of humanity for the purpose of judging them and bringing in righteousness and establishing his own kingdom here on earth. Um, so that's what we, we're we going to be working towards this theme. And I just gave you kind of a sneak peek view uh, in graphics like the chart that you're seeing on the screen now on the day of the Lord in the book of Revelation. We're talking about the wrath of God, which is also the day of the Lord. Where does the rapture fit in with all that? Um, you know, the popular topic of the rapture, is it even going to take place? Uh, I believe it will take place, and I believe that it'll be a wrath. I'm sorry, it'll be a rapture that takes place prior to the wrath of God being poured out. We'll talk about how the tribulation factors into these charts in time. So don't worry if you won't, if you're not understanding right now. There's another day of the Lord chart here that I have, day of the Lord in 2 Thessalonians that we're going to possibly be getting to tonight. So remember, we looked at this phrase, day of the Lord, uh, just in certain prophets, prophetic books, and it shows up um, a number of times all over the Old Testament. So it's worth going back and doing your own searches for these terms, day of the Lord. It's a prominent part of the final, what I believe is a seven-year time period, and I believe it's seven years by um, um, by Daniel's chronologies meaning it's, it's not just three and a half years that was suddenly separated from its first half of three and a half years. Based on the language that's read in a literal fashion, Daniel talks about a seven-year time period um, among the other groups of seven. So there, it, it is a seven-year um, um, bracket. So um, we're, we're working towards right now, though, and I, I think I can finish this tonight if I don't dilly-dally. We're working through the, some of those Old Testament and New Testament uh, scriptures that give us an appreciation of um, not just the book of Revelation, but end times in general. Even if you're not studying the book of Revelation, you are probably, if you're an in, if you're an um, eschatology buff, you're still going to be reading through certain other books of the New Testament that are that figure prominently when it comes to um, end time events, like Matthew chapter 24, um, you know, Luke uh, 13, uh, Mark 13, Luke. Uh, 21, 17, chapter 17, chapter 21, first and second Thessalonians, certain parts of the books of uh, Peter. So let's jump right back in where we left off last week. We left off talking about um, this idea that starting with the exile in Babylon with um, Israel, remember we already had an exile 
all the way up north to Assyria. This was the northern tribe of Israel at this time that Israel was um, existing as a divided kingdom, north and south split, northern ten tribes, southern two tribes, or really three if you count Levi. And so God, for their wickedness, allowed Assyria, the country of the, the Assyrians, to sweep down and um, carry off the uh, tribes of Israel into their lands and disperse them and and uh, 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 hold them captive and not allow them to return to their land. However, when it came to Judah, the southern tribes, the two southern tribes, they were also in the same predicament because of their idolatry, because of their wickedness, because of their injustice to their own people, um, uh, you know, because of their corruption, um, because of playing the harlot, as we're going to see here right away, it was to start reading Isaiah. This is, I'm giving the background real quick, the, the short and quick, the, 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 the Reader's Digest version, the Cliff Notes version. Um, because of their um, wickedness, God is going to start prophesying through these premier prophets in advance, right? Isaiah prophesied in advance of the exile. He's pre-exilic prophet. This is what's going to happen to you, Israel. Because of your wickedness, you've already reached a level where judgment is going to be poured out. Meaning, you can pray all you want, you can bring all the sacrifices you want, but it's not going to thwart the judgment. The judgment is now coming. It is unavoidable. And so the punishment is down the road. It's coming. It's in the pipeline, God says. It's on the assembly line. It's coming. It's unavoidable. And so all you can do now is just get prepared for it and prepare your hearts to repent and ride through the judgment, which is going to be 70 years. We're going to find out from, from uh, Jeremiah's perspective. It's going to be 70 year exile. And so um, the really, really good thing about the prophecies, I'm kind of spoiling this for you right up front in case you don't follow through with all of my um, uh, end time um, studies and in case you get lost in these uh, uh, Old Testament prophecies that we're going to be reading. Here's the overview. I'm going to give it to you right up front. I'm going to spoil it for you, okay? You know, barely five minutes into my video, 10 minutes into my video, or my iTunes the talk, I'm going to spoil it for you. God indeed promises and foretells judgment and punishment to his people Israel. However, there's always a message of restoration and hope and a reconcilement back to himself after a period of judgment, always, right? 100% of the time. Even if we don't read it in every prophet, like say the book is so small that we don't get a chance to get it. But in a book like Isaiah, we're going to see it multiple times. Jeremiah, we're going to see it multiple times. We're going to see God telling Israel, you guys are going to have to be put in timeout. You're going to be punished. You're going to be judged. I'm going to send you into exile. Um, and I'm going to allow the X amount of desolation to your land and to your temple, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be a time of restoration, uh, a time of repentance, a time of restoring the land, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the overall picture. And this factors heavily into not just the book of Revelation, but into the entire scope of end time events. As bad as it's going to get on planet Earth, the 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 the, um, the trajectory of all of these judgments and tribulations and wrath of God being poured out and you know blood and fire and and hail and smoke and locusts and all this stuff is God's moving towards uh, um, a restoration of Israel. Um, a, a refining of his people, a bringing in to his kingdom, an ushering of his kingdom, a bringing in of his kingdom, and populating with his people Israel and with the people known as the church, bringing these people in so that God can dwell with his people in righteousness, where, where King Messiah rules for a thousand years, at least if you take the literal thousand year perspective like I do. So the point is, we're even as, as horrible as it's going to be getting, it's not the end of the world destruction where there's not going to be any ray of hope. There's there's hope after the destruction. That's the point I'm trying to bring up. So let's rapidly move through some of these passages. I'm not going to read all of these. I'm, I'm going to be selectively reading. But last week, let me do segue where we pick up where we left off last week. Is that right at the very beginning of Isaiah's prophecy, these little headings in your Bibles, these bolded headings above the paragraphs are very, very helpful. I'm going to borrow some of those. This is the NASB version of the Bible. I'm tra- kind of transitioning out of using ESV all the time and transition into using NASB more this year. Let's see how that works out for my studies. So the heading for this particular setting, starting at verse, uh, this particular chapter of one, starting at verse 21, is Zion corrupted will be redeemed. Even in the chapter heading, we can see the overall picture that I'm trying to talk about. Starting in verse 21, how the faithful city has become a prostitute. This factors heavily into understanding eschatological Jerusalem's place in the end time scenario where um, I believe the Antichrist will indeed use her as a tool 
uh, during his one world um, new order that he's going to be establishing on planet Earth in the future. Jerusalem, because she is um, has not accepted her Messiah yet, is going to be prime target uh, to be possibly at least headquarters for um, part of the Antichrist's uh, ungodly religious uh, scheme, or she might even play the part of Mystery Babylon herself. Um, we'll talk about that when the time comes. But she is likened to the prostitute, and the book of Revelation chapter 17 talks about the great harlot, the great the woman who rides the scarlet beast, this, this mother of prostitutes. Similar language that we're going to find here over and over again that John the Revelator borrowed, obviously, um, from the Old Testament prophets. Uh, God calls his wife a prostitute. Why? Because she's playing the harlot with all of these other um, false gods and, and um, um, foreign uh, idols and et cetera, et cetera. And so you have to remember when the Bible talks about prostitution in this sense, it's not talking about literal prostitution, but it's borrowing from that understanding of a woman, whether she's married or not, that that doesn't matter. But in Israel's case, she is married to God. So Israel is the bride and God is the husband. And in this case, she's an unfaithful wife who's playing the prostitute. But we know from history and in real life that even single women can be prostitutes. You don't have to be married to be a prostitute. And so really the picture is one of spiritual harlotry, spiritual prostitution, spiritual um, uh, adultery. And so in that sense, it doesn't matter whether you're married to God or uh, like Israel, or if you're just one of the nations, the surrounding nations, you can fall into the category of being labeled as being playing spirit, uh, being guilty of spiritual prostitution, spiritual harlotry, because you are not giving God the the place that is only due Him, that should be due to Him, right? Um, think about uh, the state of, of affairs in the world today. Um, idolatry is the predominant state of affairs in the world today. Predominantly, uh, city after city, country after country, people after people, um, culture after culture, all around the world. Thousands and millions and billions of people are swept away in this giant wave of spiritual idolatry and, and wickedness and um, harlotry, playing with idols and all of that which has, has dominated their cultures for thousands of years, multiplied thousands of years. It's the default state of mankind and humanity in the world today, right? There's no, it's, it's, this is indisputable fact, right? It's irrefutable. You cannot refute it. Right. If someone's going to tell me that, no, Ariel, righteousness covers the earth today. Right. Christianity is the, the is the predominant um, move and, and pulse and uh, state of affairs and, and uh, perspective in the world today. I'm sorry. You're what what rock are you living under? Right. What planet are you from? As great as Christianity is, um, I'm sorry, it's dwarfed by the wickedness and the idolatry. Of humanity in the earth today, and the you know the um, the the prince of the power of the air, Satan, has his hooks in every single culture on the face of planet Earth right now. Even Christianity isn't established in every nation. I mean, it should be, and eventually someday, perhaps it will be. But look at the rise of Islam. Look at the rise of um, of of um, Spiritism and New Age religions, and and look at the rise of of um, you know um, Hinduism and and uh, other competitive religions to, to Christianity. You're trying to tell me that those other competitive religions um, are 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 God approved? I don't think so. Yeah. So wickedness, i.e., uh, spiritual harlotry, is the default position in the world today at the moment. But one day, Yeshua is going to come and judge all of that, and he must judge all of that. And we have to factor that in when we're reading, when we're going to, as we're working towards like the book of Revelation, and we're talking about the mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, the mother of spiritual harlotry and um, idolatry that exists in the world today. How big is this system? Well, currently it's worldwide, right? Worldwide. It's the default position. So back to Israel. God is singling her out because she's in covenant faithfulness with him as his bride. But this doesn't mean that the other nations are um, scot-free. They're off the hook. Nope, they're not. We're going to find that God judges Israel because of her idolatry, but then God turns around and judges Babylon for the way she treats Israel. And because Babylon is, a, is rife with idolatry as well. 
In other words, um, doesn't matter if you're Israel, God's bride, or you're the surrounding nations, you're still swept up in idolatry one way or another by the end of the age, and God has to judge all of that. So she was she's a prostitute, she's full of she who was full of justice, righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murderers, your silvers become waste matter, blah, blah, blah. I'm skipping through a lot of this and working my way towards where God finally starts to saying, starts trying to say, um, I will turn my hand against you. Um, but notice in verse 26, the tone changes. Then I will restore your judges as at first. When? After I smelt away your impurities with lie and remove all your slag, then I will restore your judges. So notice there's a punishment that's coming, and then there's a restoration and a rest and a, a, a restoring, a restoration and a repentance that Israel can look forward to. After that, you will be called city of righteousness, a faithful city. So notice from God's bigger perspective, it's not all doom and gloom. Zion, verse 27, will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. And the, the big theme that I don't want you to lose sight of is that covenantally, God only speaks of redemption and restoration for his people for those whom he is within covenant relation with. This means um, uh, on the natural level, this would have been uh, national Israel, the, the, the type and shadow picture that's being painted by national Israel. This is not spiritual salvation that we're talking about when we're reading these passages. We're talking about uh, um, a, a symbolic uh, view of what it means to be in relationship with God. On the natural level, this was demonstrated by historic Israel, but on the spiritual level, this can only happen one-on-one -on -one when you have a relationship with Jesus himself. So for those of you who are listening to this video or listening to the podcast, watching this video, and you are believers, you're Christians, then just know that as you read through the prophecies of Israel here that we're going to be jumping through during this first hour, you have to realize that whether you're Jewish or not, that this is the Bible's way of portraying your relationship to God through Messiah as is seen through the lens of God's relationship to Israel. This doesn't mean that, again, all these people that, that Israel is going to bring, that God's going to bring back from exile, that they're salvifically saved, that they're somehow um, spiritually saved. That's not what it means. It's the type and shadow. It's the picture of, like, say, the Exodus story, being delivered from Egypt and being brought into the promised land as a type and shadow of being delivered from our own personal Egypt of sin and shame and being brought into a relationship with Messiah, i.e., into the the spiritual promised land of heaven. So that's the bigger picture that we're reading here as well. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's exclusive, this salvation picture, whether it's a physical, national, political salvation, or it's a spiritual salvation, right? Where it's the very your very soul that's saved. Either way, the bigger picture, the Bible is going to always point and always paint as that the salvation is exclusive only to those who, who find themselves in a righteous relationship with God, whether it's at the natural level leading to spiritual salvation or you're already a believer in Jesus and a believer in God. But either way, it's exclusive. And why is this a necessary factor to remember? Because as we begin reading through these prophecies, you have to remember that the tale of two cities theme is that God punishes Israel, the righteous, Jerusalem, the righteous city, and yet he then redeems her. Right, He rescues her from her, her oppressors, and the reason for the punishment was so that he could refine her and, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, melt away all the wickedness right, and skim all that off like you would heat up metal and melt off the dross, right? bring it to the surface so you can scoop it away and have the pure metal there. Well, the same thing goes on that's happening with Israel, the righteous city, Jerusalem. She's being punished, but it's for the purpose of restoration and, re and, uh, and um, refinement and, uh, and uh, God um, bringing, him back, bringing her back to himself in righteousness. But it is not the same for the wicked city, the Babylon uh, model that we're using in our two cities, the tale of two cities. The wicked cities of the earth that Babylon personifies in my model here of the tale of two cities— Babylon is a picture of the wicked cities on the earth that will go through judgment and punishment, but there's no restoration. They don't get restored to God because they're not in relationship with God to begin with. Their punishment is final. It's complete. It's a judgment unto death. And it is that wicked that we find at the very end of the book of Revelation, who stand before the great white throne judgment of God and receive that final punishment of being cast into the lake of fire. 
just like the Antichrist and the false beast, uh, the false prophet, um, Satan himself gets cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell gets cast into the lake of fire. So the 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 culmination of the of of all things from God's perspective is that righteousness will be established and rewarded and live on into eternity with God. And this includes righteous people and righteous nations, righteous individuals who who make up righteous nations. But on the flip side of that, judgment comes down hard on wickedness, and of course the the father of wickedness is Satan himself. But all those wicked systems, all those beast empires that Satan has been using down through the centuries. Right, um, going all the way back to um, OG Babylon, Nimrod's Babylon, Genesis chapter uh, 10, 11, and 12, that Babylon, right? Um, way back then, um, and then uh, we see, and from the biblical perspective, we have Egypt, and then we have Assyria, then we have Neo Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, then we have the Medes and the Persians, then we have Greece, then we have Rome, uh, then we have um, all the wicked empires that have existed in this, uh, what we might call the church age, you know, the Ottoman empires and the, 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 the Nazi regimes and all these, these evil empires that Satan has obviously had his hand in, um, culminating in this revived Roman empire that's going to um, play an important part in the new world order. The point being is that judgment lands hard on those evil and wicked empires, and they are seen in the prophecies as having a final destruction. Maybe a partial one in the prophecies, but an end, a final one uh, by the time we get to the book of Revelation where all is said and done. And they are not revived, meaning they are not redeemed. They are not um, purified, as it were. God takes his people out of those. In fact, he tells us, not just in the prophets, but in the book of Revelation, come out of her, my people. Speaking of this system of wickedness known as Babylon, come out of her. Why? Because I'm going to judge her. I'm going to bring her down and I'm going to wipe her out. Right, and this is for righteousness' sake. Punishment has to land on on righteousness, and judgment has to land because God needs to vindicate, um, hit not just righteousness, but vindicate the punishment that wickedness has been persecuting righteousness from um, from from time past. Right, from from the time when um, man stepped off the ark and started repopulating the earth. So, let me stop. Um, uh, uh, dilly dallying and just get through these passages. So that's what I wanted to just say. Wrong. In fact, this is what the prophet says in verse 28. We can see these back to back. Zion will be redeemed, verse 27. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness, right? That's the tale of two cities on the Jerusalem, the good side. Well, watch, look at verse 28. But, right, contrast, wrongdoers and sinners together will be broken, and those who abandon the Lord will come to an end. Notice the, the gloomy outlook for the evil, right? The, the wrongdoers, sinners together, broken. Those who abandon the Lord will come to an end. There's no restoration for them. Why? Because they have abandoned the Lord, so the Lord will abandon them. That's the end of the story for those who reject God and reject his Messiah. That's the, the, the final, uh, uh, the, the big picture that I don't want you to lose sight of. All right. So using that um, as our kind of our... Um, our uh, theme. Uh, let's jump through a lot of passages and see if we can cover this in the next um, 35 or 40 minutes. Let's jump quickly. Isaiah chapter 2, God's universal reign. What the prophets are going to begin to describe is that after the eschatological judgments and wrath of Satan and wrath of God that's poured on earth, there will be a, uh, um, a kingdom of righteousness that's going to be ushered in. And whether you believe this is a spiritual thousand-year kingdom or a literal thousand-year kingdom, like I believe it's a literal, either way, it's a time of righteousness um, when uh, God will be the um, only one who's recognized, or I should say he'll be the predominant one that will be recognized. So we see this described in the uh, headings of the uh, chapters here, Isaiah chapter 2, God's universal reign. Notice the word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days, the Akhoit Haimim, we could see this as the near prophecy. Remember, prophecy itself has a, a telescoping effect built into it, where sometimes an event is describing a near-term event or near-time um, uh, happening that's near to the prophet who's writing it. And then it may come to pass in the now of the prophet or maybe the, the generation, uh, one or two generations away from the prophet. So we call that near or now. 
But yet at the same time, if we look at the language carefully and just look, line it, uh, confirm it with history, fact check it against the world, the state of affairs around us, we can obviously observe that there's parts of the prophecy that are not yet or far. So it doesn't matter which title you give it, near slash far or now slash not yet. They're both describing the same idea that there's this telescoping. It's like two mountain peaks seen from a distance and you don't know the valley between the, the, the distance of the valley between the two mountain peaks or the or the perspective is just it's a kind of a, um, a an optical illusion as it were the prophets looked like they're foretelling maybe one event the language seems to capture one event but in reality it's maybe a near event and a far event or a now event and a not yet event something like that so notice this language and you can't get lost in this the, the prophets don't warn you hey by the way now i'm going to be talking about near oh now i'm going to be talking about far sometimes they, they use key language like it'll say uh, it's for the final days or it's, uh, shut up this vision until the end, like we read in the book of Daniel or things like that. This is for the latter days or in the final days it will come to pass or, you know, in the in the days later or something like that. Sometimes the prophets do that. But other than that, you just have to catch the context. You got to read carefully. Not meant to be confusing, but it is meant to be that that precious gem that you have to dig for. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as a chief of the mountains, right? Rebuilding of the temple. Remember, Isaiah is prophesying, prophesying about not just the the, uh, the exile to Babylon, but the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But he's prophesying that the temple is going to be rebuilt and reestablished in the last days. Does this mean um, the uh, rebuilt temple uh, by um, King Herod? Well, in the, in the short scope term of things yes it does but notice the language it will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the lord to the house of the god of jacob so that he may teach us about his ways that we may walk in his paths for the law will go out of zion and the word of the lord from jerusalem okay part of that happened in the first century right the temple was a house of prayer for all peoples um jerusalem was a place where many peoples from all the nations streamed into it and the torah was going forth from um zion in the first century right so this was partially fulfilled but notice then um um isaiah shifts without telling us uh that he's shifting notice the language and he will judge between the nations and he will mediate for many peoples and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will he learn war. Has that happened yet? Not on your life, right? Just turn on the news, go to your computer, pull out your smartphone. There's war and rumors of wars all over the world, right? Currently there's a a massive war that's been going on for over a year in uh, Ukraine, right, with Russia and things like that. Um, there, there are skirmishes all over the world. So nation is still lifting up sword against nation. That's what's going on. So this means that this prophecy isn't fully um, fulfilled yet. It's only been partially fulfilled by the bringing in and the rebuilding of the temple, which now is lying in ruins, right? So that also tells us why this cannot be um, totally fulfilled because currently the, the temple is in ruins, right? Or at least it's the Temple Mount is occupied by that um, Dome of the Rock um, uh, Islamic uh, shrine up there, right? That's not God's plan. That's not part of God's righteousness. That, that's part of the um, other crowd, right? So um, what what is Isaiah and the rest of the prophets going to be doing for this? They're just going to be showing us that very early on, God is using the exile of Israel, particularly the Babylonian exile, to highlight this concept of punishment for God's people for the purpose of refining them and restoring them and redeeming them and bringing them back to himself, although a significant number of people will have to perish in that refinement and in that punishment. But there's always restoration on the horizon. The, the end of the picture is always going to be that God is restoring things and, and, uh, and, and establishing righteousness and bringing in that which is holy and righteous. But it's not so for the wickedness that surrounds righteousness, that has always been oppressing righteousness. God has to judge wickedness, and that he will do. And so that's what we're going to be seeing as we um, uh, skip through these passages very, very quickly. Notice uh, right in the same passage, if I scroll down, it says a day of reckoning is coming. This is the day of the Lord, which is the 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 the, the fullest judgmental time period that God has on his calendar, and then that will be it. When it comes to judging the wickedness of mankind, the whole, the, this, um, um, what we might call era of mankind will come to an end with God's final wrath being poured out in the time period known as the day of the Lord. And so the language that you're going to find the prophets often is this, the day or when that day comes or in that day, they'll use language similar to that. Those, that'll kind of clue you into the idea 
um, of this judgment. And it's seen through the lens of the Babylonian exile because on the near slash now aspect, right, the smaller fulfillment, it's a punishment against Babylon, that wicked city who oppressed and exiled Jerusalem and the Jewish people and, and destroyed the temple. So the smaller um, sort of preteristic um, historical punishment uh, that takes place is either against judgment against Israel and or judgment against the wicked nation such as Babylon or, or Egypt or whoever is in view of the prophecy. But the larger picture that I won't, don't want you to lose sight of when we're talking about near, far, or now and not yet is that Jerusalem and the Jewish people still have to go through this punishment in the future as a national entity in order to bring in righteousness. And at the same time, the entire world will be judged in wickedness and righteousness as God, I'm sorry, in, in judgment of the, for their unrighteousness and for their idolatry and, and, and rejecting God and in, embracing the lie of the Antichrist and, and embracing the lie of Satan down through the ages, right? It's not just a judgment against that generation in the future. Please don't misunderstand me. The judgments that are coming upon mankind in the future is the culmination of mankind's wickedness as has it existed for the entire scope of humanity from since the time that man first ate of the forbidden fruit in the garden and sin entered into the world. From that point, judgment was already in store for mankind and in store for Satan and the Antichrist or all of the, the beast systems that would rise up uh, and all of the, the, the idolatrous systems and wickedness and adul uh, idolatries, uh, adulteries and, and spiritual darkness that has permeated the earth from day one. All of that has to be judged on a day that God is appointing in the future. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not that God just suddenly says, okay, I'm gonna, just going to judge this final seven-year generation. You know, too bad, so sad for you guys. You guys just happen to be the one that lives during the time when I pour out all my wrath. No, that's not how it works. It's a judgment against the entire system. The entire system comes crashing down in the end, and God establishes righteousness and judges wickedness. So, for the Lord of armies will have a day of reckoning. This is the day of the Lord. On the short order, it is the um, punishment against Babylon and the wicked nations. But on the lar larger scale, it's punishment against um, uh, eschatological Babylon and the end time new world order that's going to be established. Everyone, uh, it's a reckoning and a judgment against everyone who's arrogant and haughty against everyone who's lifted up. Notice it's not just a judgment or reckoning against Israel, right? You have to remember the language of punishment is used to reserve for those who are God's people, but the language of judgment is is best reserved for those who are not God's people. We could distinguish between those verbs and that would be helpful, um, even though sometimes there's a little bit of overlap between the word judgment and the word punishment, but it's gonna be help. It's gonna actually do you a lot of good in your prophetic studies if you get that mindset in established in place right up front, is that God punishes his own children and his own bride, right, Israel slash, uh, the church. He punishes them, but it's in righteousness. He doesn't destroy them. It's a punishment towards reconciliation and um, uh, um, um, a reestablishment of, of relationship. So that's the type of punishment that takes place against his own righteous people or his people who should be righteous, but are playing the harlot. They're, 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 they're um, indulged in wickedness and et cetera, et cetera. It's for the purpose of redeeming them, rescuing them out of that and refining them, right? Uh, helping them to understand who's truly uh, his bride and who isn't. But when it comes to wicked people, and I'm gonna, just going to keep stressing this because I don't want you to misunderstand. When it comes to wickedness, there's no punishment towards restoration there's only judgment towards destruction so notice this language and be very very specific um everyone who's arrogant and haughty will be brought low it will be against all the cedars of lebanon and start and god stops starts naming off all these surrounding nations that have played some part in uh subjugating israel um or uh you know aiding and abetting in her exile and, and and things like that and so that's all language that on the near term is going to actually take place against those wicked nations who were at, in existence at the time that israel went into exile in you know in the fourth or fifth century sixth century bc like we're reading about in these prophecies but on the on the larger scale these refer to um people groups that exist around israel today if you pull up a map of israel you'll see that she's surrounded by people who are not friendly towards her right egypt in the south jordan to the east um um lebanon to the north syria to the north 
um, Iraq and Iran to the north and east. Um, you know, uh, she's surrounded by people who would, you know, even right there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem itself is split between east and west Jerusalem. I have to keep reminding myself whenever I read about Jerusalem in the Bible that the Jerusalem of today is split along lines of east and west Jerusalem, and it's only west Jerusalem that is more or less Israel. And even then, it's got the four quarters that are separating, you know, the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the 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 the, the Armenian quarter, and then the um the, the Catholic quarter. I can't I think it's called Catholic, the Orthodox quarter, whatnot. Um, you know, even Jerusalem, even West Jerusalem, which is supposed to be Israel's side of Jerusalem, is court sectioned off, and then you've got you know, this slice in the middle as you go towards the Mediterranean Sea West, and then you run into Gaza Strip, which has been occupied uh, by, not by Israel historically, but by either the Philistines of, of old or now is occupied by the uh, Palest um, by the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, Arab groups of peoples, um, the Palestinians, uh, in Gaza Strip. But the East Bank, uh, I'm sorry, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, you know, that side of the Jordan is all occupied by um, Arab groups of peoples who are hostile to Israel. We just as soon see Israel swallowed off and swallowed up and disappeared off the map. Why do I say all that? It's because even now, currently in the state affairs of Israel today, politically and religiously speaking, there's a lot of oppression there that God one day will have to sort all of that out. And so when we read through these prophecies and we see these names of, of, um, of uh, cities and people groups, a lot has changed from this time in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that we're going to be reading about till today, right? A lot of people have, you know, Jerusalem has changed hands quite a number of times. She's been plowed under quite a number of times. She's been renamed quite a number of times, right? Um, there's a lot of history there, ugly, and a lot of blood there, right? The, the soil is quite literally soaked in blood. And so in the end, it's not always easy to ascertain which people group God is referring to when he says, you know, Tarshish or this person, that person. We can use a little bit of history and figure that out, but ultimately, um, you know, places and, and uh, people groups change names and people get, uh, um, uh, uh, um, what do you say, assimilated into other people groups and they take on the name of another group. And, and so, you know, cultures change and disappear, rise and fall. So, um, don't get too put off by some of these names if you can't match the number one one to one matchup between current um, uh, map groups uh, on Google today. So don't worry about that. The, the the overall picture is that there's judgment coming on that part of the world for the wickedness that has existed for centuries and centuries in that part of the world because it's a spiritual wickedness. Remember what Paul said in the Book of Ephesians. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, people. We wrestle against the principalities and the, against the spiritual wickedness, against the darkness and the rulers of this world, right? It's a spiritual entity that um, that can go back and forth uh, around the world and draw um, wicked men, mankind, into its program. So that's why we have to see this as a, a spiritual battle, a giant chessboard that's manipulating the humans and the nations, but at the same time, it's really a cosmic battle in the heavenlies uh, between forces that are much more powerful than any human could ever uh, deal with. So uh, this is Isaiah's look, uh, at least right away the, uh, uh, in chapter 2. Let me see if I can just highlight some of these and looking at some of the um, 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 headings that here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 13, judgment on the day of the Lord. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. We even have the phrase day of the Lord. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every heart will, human heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will ride like a woman in labor. Notice the language when it talks about labor pains. Uh, reminds me of Matthew chapter 24 and, and Mark 13 and Luke 17, um, where Yeshua is giving his all of it discourse and he talks about um, the, the, the birth pangs and things like that. They'll look at one another in astonishment, the faces of flame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fire and burning anger. A major theme of the day of the Lord is this fire and burning and this judgment by um, fire and heat and, and uh, those types of um, language descriptors. And the reason that's important is because if you recall, when God judged the world in with Noah's flood, it was a judgment by water. The description of the um, judgment on humanity and the destruction of, of all the, the, the people of the world and the re pushing the reset button by God, with the exception of Noah and his family, was done through water. 
And then God promised through the covenant with, that he had with the earth and the sign of the rainbow and the cloud that never again will I flood the earth with water. But God did not promise that he wouldn't judge the earth again. Indeed, because of wickedness that exists, that exists in the earth, because of um, wicked humanity rejecting God over and over again, man is headed towards destruction once again. And so God must bring judgment, but this time it will be predominantly with fire. And that's the theme of the judge of the day of the Lord is the judgment and destruction by fire. And so we're going to see that over and over again when you're reading through the day of the Lord uh, prophecies, fire and burning anger, um, things like that. That whole theme, uh, that that motif, that that symbol of of using burning elements. The the the, the you know the, the 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 even the earth will be burned up. The, the elements will melt. Um, you know the, the 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 sky will be burned up and things like that. The stars of heaven, their light, uh, he will exterminate the sinners from the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. This language should remind you of prophecies from Joel, prophecies that Yeshua picked up on, prophecies the book of Revelation is going to pick up on. Um, the, the, the cosmic lights being turned out because of the day of the Lord's arrival being signaled by the flash of and the brightness of the Lord's coming himself. So remember, this is another theme that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. I can't help but stop and comment. The day of the Lord is signaled by um, these cosmic signs in the heavens, the darkness of the sun and the moon and the stars, so that the brilliance of the Lord's arrival, the parousia, can be observed by not just the wicked, but by the righteous. And so the day of the Lord has this dual theme. Primarily, the theme of the day of the Lord is the destruction of the wicked. But it, before that, it's the rescue of the righteous. And so the, the sign that signals the arrival of the day of the Lord, the parousia of Messiah, right? The coming of the Lord, when I say the parousia, um, some people say parousia or something like that. But uh, I believe the Greek is pronounced parousia. That theme is primarily one of fear and a day that comes like a thief in the night for those who don't know God. And so they're fearful, they're, they're, they're shaking in their boots, and they should be because it's a day of re reckoning with God himself for the wickedness and, right, and the ungodliness that mankind has um, been steeped in from since all the way days back. But for those of us who are righteous, it's our day of redemption, it's our day of rescue, it's God um, um, come to vindicate us and to deliver us from the wicked system that is uh, would would seek to destroy us, right, as, as evil always persecutes righteousness. And so... Um, we who are righteous, we look forward to the day of the Lord, but those who are wicked, they should not look forward to the day of the Lord. So again, we see these dual themes, these the, the binary qualities of the day of the Lord, both the, 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 um, the ushering in or the bringing in of the coming of the Lord to rescue us from the persecution, from wickedness, right? From the beast systems that, that are all around us, like Israel has her Babylons, right? The church has her... Uh, a wickedness that's all around her and the persecution of the Antichrist that she will have to face in the final days. But it's the punishment of the wicked that this day of the Lord um, sign also heralds. And so in verse 11 of Isaiah 13, so I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their wrongdoing. So that's the theme of the day of the Lord. But again, it's this, this um, rescue of the righteous. So I don't want to spend all the time on that one. Judgment on the earth, Isaiah chapter 24. Behold, the, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, twists its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. Notice the universal scope of the judgment of the day of the Lord, which is bigger than punishing just wicked Babylon who exiled Israel in the 4th or 5th or 6th century, right? In 586 BC when she sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Notice, if it's just a judgment on Babylon, why does God have to judge the entire earth? What did they have to do with exiling Israel and carrying her off into captivity? Ah, that's where we need to keep sight of the bigger picture by the prophets. God is utilizing the occurrence of the exile of his people to uh, announce to not just Israel, but announce to the entire world through the prophets here. That judgment is going to be coming upon the entire world and its wicked systems. Remember, wickedness has been in the earth for a lot longer than Israel has existed on the earth, 
right? Just remind yourself of that. And that's going to help us understand why when we get through the to the book of Revelation, why so many of the judgments are universal in scope, why they're covering large parts of the world or what we might call the earth dwellers, those who dwell on the earth, the, the wicked beast system, the final uh, eighth empire that Satan raises up in the final days, the mark of the beast that he imposes on who? Israel only. Nope. That he imposes on who? Only people in America. No, the mark of the beast is imposed on everyone around the world. You can't buy or sell unless you have the mark, according to uh, Revelation chapter 13. And so um, this mark is going to be universal in the sense that it'll be international. It's something that is a, is a, a, a wickedness that's going to be um, affecting everyone in the world, no matter where you live, great and small, rich and poor. And so for that reason, the idolatrous practices that are um, personified by this, this evil woman, Mystery Babylon, whether she be Jerusalem or the literal rebuilt Babylon, no matter which perspective you take, either way, it's a universal scope. It's got to be larger than just one city per se, even if that one city is maybe the the the, the representative of it. The 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 wickedness itself is far uh, more uh, reaching, uh, and that's why we're reading these judgments uh, in the prophets that are on the entire earth. Behold, the uh, the Lord lays the earth waste. Why? It's because wickedness is everywhere right now. But notice that we, as we're skipping through Isaiah, the greatness of God, comfort, comfort my people, says, God, speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her guilt has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Even that word doubling is language that shows up uh, when describing Mystery Babylon, the book of Revelation, leads a lot of people to believe that Mystery Babylon is eschatological Jerusalem because of the word, the phrase is doubling for all her sins. And this is language that only shows up against uh, Israel. It doesn't show up, the word doubling doesn't show up against the wicked nations of the world. But regardless of the language that the, the book of Revelation borrows from the prophets, what we see is that God promises to bring Israel back to a place of redemption, no matter how wicked she gets. God is not going to allow Satan to ultimately dis persecute and destroy Israel so as to leave Messiah with no one to inherit the righteous kingdom. That would mean that Satan would win. You understand what I'm saying? God has to rescue Israel because that's how God keeps good on his promises made to the forefathers. And God vindicates his own righteousness and his own righteous name and establishes his own son's kingdom that was foretold way back in Daniel, uh, as, as early as Daniel chapter um, 7, where the... Um, uh, the 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 son of the one like the son of man approaches the ancient of days and is given a kingdom. Of course, these prophecies go even much further, right? Uh, even way back to the Torah of Moses, where uh, the the scepter of righteousness shall not depart from from uh, Shiloh. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, depart from um, between from Judah until Shiloh comes. So we're talking about prophecies of a coming messianic age, but it's it's ruled by a messianic. Um, descendant of David, right? A messianic uh, uh, a king, a righteous king, but it has to have righteous subjects. And so if Satan is able to not just persecute God's people, right? Israel and uh, genuine Christians, the church, if he's not able to just persecute them, but actually wipe them out, well, then there won't be anyone to inherit the kingdom. And so um, that's what he's working towards. He tries and tries and tries using his beast kingdoms to destroy God's people, so that there won't be anyone to inherit the kingdom. But God says, no, to be kindly, Jerusalem, call out to her that her warfare is in it, that her guilt has been removed. She has received the Lord's hand double for her sins. The voice of one crying out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. This is, of course, the, the voice of Isaiah that John the Baptist picks up and walks in the spirit of, right? The one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the make straight in the desert, uh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So, um, these are wonderful passages because they speak of this greater exodus of Israel coming out of the out from under the persecution of Egypt, being supernaturally protected during this time period of a greater exodus that we're going to read about in some of these prophecies, prophecies, if I can get to them. But notice, again, we're in the same book, Isaiah, but we're in chapter 47. There's a mourning for Babylon. Why? Because um, Babylon is going to personify the um, the, 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 the culmination of the wicked world systems. And so um, there's language that shows up in the prophets very early, like I said, we're in Isaiah, that we're going to read about that is borrowed again and repeated 
almost verbatim in the book of Revelation, particularly like when we get to Jeremiah in the 50s, that helps us understand that God has judged Babylon, yes, for her exiling of Israel in the past, yes, but that was only on the partial fulfillment. The final judgment is awaiting because of the language that it talks about. Indeed, Babylon went on to survive the, the partial judgment uh, so much to the point that people, uh, there are Jews who stayed on in Babylon that, that thrived. There was a Jewish presence that thrived in Babylon even after the exec exile and even produced, are you ready for it? The Babylonian Talmud. Yeah, that's right. The Babylonian Talmud comes from Babylon. That's the name. You know, Ta Talmud Bavli is the Babylonian Talmud that was that was kind of um, formulated in that day, at least orally, until it was finally codified in the in the first uh, centuries and following. But the point I'm trying to say is that not only did Babylon survive the exile and the punishment that was foretold in these prophets, but currently, like I said, if I Google search it, I'll just put a little graphic on the screen and post that shows that the current um, population of current Babylon, as in um, not it's it's Neo Babylon, but it's really now we can think of like um, Saddam Hussein's Babylon, right? Um, the one I, the Iraq Babylon is currently over a million people residing in Babylon today, right? I think it's almost like a million and a half or something like that. I'll put the little graphic on the screen for you. So this morning for Babylon is is describing not just the partial fulfillment of her destruction, but ultimately, if we look at the language carefully, we'll see that there's language that foretells of her future and future and total. A destruction that's that's in the works as well. Um, Isaiah 60, a glorified Zion. Again, Israel is going to find her place where God is going to restore her. So no matter how dark and bleak it gets for Israel in any given age, God's ultimate goal for Israel is restoration, Zion, and establishing his name there. She will not pass away uh, into the trash heaps of history, like some of these other nations eventually will. Eventually, there will be no more Babylon. One day, there will be no more wicked Babylon on the earth because righteousness will reign, the new heavens and the new earth will be recreated, and Babylon will be relegated to the trash heap of history Those of one of those wicked nations that, that opposed God and his Messiah. But not Israel. Jerusalem's name will live on. Indeed, at the very end of the book of Revelation, we have the new Jerusalem. There is no new Babylon that comes down out of heaven, people. There's no new Egypt or no um, new uh, fill-in-the-blank with your favorite wicked city uh, that, that rises up anywhere in, in the end, end times. It's only Jerusalem's, that name, that carries on because God has placed his name there and he has set his affection on that uh, particular uh, part of of at least this world. I don't know how the new age is a new earth where new Jerusalem will be parked. Maybe it'll be over ancient Jerusalem or current Jerusalem. Um, maybe it'll be over the North Pole. I'm not sure. Uh, but the point is, the point I'm simply trying to make is may bring up is that it's the word Jerusalem. We don't have to imagine that it's going to be some different name, like some preterists believe that, oh yeah, in the future there will be a, a new Jerusalem, but it won't be called Jerusalem anymore. I think Chris White talks about how that Jerusalem will come back after her destruction in the, first, in, in the end times, he holds to a Jerusalem as eschatological uh, um, mystery Babylon model. Uh, but he believes that Jerusalem itself will be renamed, you know, uh, the Lord of Righteousness. So she won't even be called Jerusalem anymore. But there are too many other prophecies that, that uh, counteract, that go against what he's trying to say there. So I think he's on shaky ground there. Nevertheless, he's a great Bible teacher, though. Even though I don't fully agree with his um, Jer Jerusalem view, I do hold to his is um, pre refu That's uh, Chris White. All right, so let's wrap this part up. I'm not going to finish this tonight. Um, just just to help you understand, we'll, pick, we'll, we'll stretch this out into one more week. We'll pick this up next week um, where we'll start into the book of Jeremiah. Notice I just finished with Isaiah. So this is a great uh, place to stop. But the end of the book of Isaiah, remember we started, as I'm bringing this study to a close, we started in Isaiah with Israel being called a prostitute, right? The She who was once faithful is now playing the harlot and she is going into destruction and into exile and Jerusalem will be plowed under or destroyed, uh, set on fire. The temple is going to be sacked, right? First wicked nation to ever do so. First, first foreign nation, Gentile nation to ever sack Jerusalem is Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is Babylon. And thus the 70 years of exile began. Daniel was carted off as a teenager in, off into Babylon as well. And so that's the beginning of the book of Isaiah. But just using the book of Isaiah as a snapshot, 
we can turn and see that, that all the way here at the end, we're only in chapter 60 and we still got six more chapters, which we're not going to look at in our study, but you can do it on your own. You'll notice that suddenly it's the restoration and the glorification of Zion and Jerusalem and the restoration of God's people unto himself that's in full view with a view towards the, the final end time um, New Jerusalem and the thousand year reign of Messiah and then the New Jerusalem after that. All of that is in full view as we get towards the very end of the book. So just using Isaiah, we can say it starts out doomy and gloomy, but it ends in restoration and blessing and um, God uh, being reconciled to his people like it should be. And why is that? And I'll say this and then I'll close. It's not because of things that Israel is doing. It's not because she's so clever. It's not because she's so, so good looking. It's not because she is so righteous in her deeds. Far from it. Because of her wickedness, she goes off into um, exile and judgment and punishment over and over again. But it's because God is faithful, people. It's because God himself has promised, made promises to the forefathers, and God has promised, uh, swearing on his own uh, on his own name, that he will establish righteousness for himself, that he'll create a name for himself in the earth, that he'll raise up a people for himself, that his son Messiah is going to rule over, that he will give this kingdom to his son, the righteous ruler, the righteous king, the son of man, the son of God, the son of David, that he, God made promises to David that you will never lack a man to sit on your throne, David, even though there will be periods where Israel is going to go out of existence, as it were, there will always be a remnant, God promises, that God will preserve for himself, that he can start the fires burning all over again, and eventually this remnant grows into, you know, starts out as a small kind of mustard seed size, but grows into a larger group of people, innumerable, because we know the church has been brought into this uh, people group of Israel, swelling our numbers to, to where it's uncountable. And now the promise is given to Abraham so long ago, where the your, your descendants will be like the stars of the sky, uncountable, and the sand on the seashore, uncountable, innumerable, can only be fulfilled with the bringing in of the church or the righteous Gentiles into Israel. It can never really be fulfilled by national Israel standards alone. So it's so important as we're reading through these prophecies to catch the scope of God's people, national Israel. But at the same time, there's a view towards the church who's brought into the people of Israel as part of this establishing of a kingdom that will rule and reign with Messiah here on planet Earth for a thousand years. But in order to get to that point, God has to deal with both the uh, compromising church wayward, backwards, uh, backsliding, um, um, uh, what do we say, uh, uh, co compromising, and in some cases, dead church. But at the same time, he has to still deal with national Israel, people who don't know their Messiah. So we're going to work our way towards that. Next week, we'll start right away in with uh, Jeremiah, um, starting in chapter 16. And we'll begin to uh, sort of build a little bit of this um, what's known as the greater exodus because jeremiah 16 and jeremiah 23 both have prophecies that talk about and i'll just kind of give you this little teaser um if we scroll down to verse um let me see you find it here god will restore them starting at verse 14 behold the days are coming right day of the lord um, declares the Lord and will be no longer be said as the Lord lives who brought us brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt verse 15 but as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of evil uh, Israel from the land of the north and from the lands where he has banished them why for I will restore them to their own land which I gave to their forefathers to, to their fathers so this is what we call the greater exodus that is that was fulfilled partially by God bringing the people back out of exile uh, in Jeremiah's time right remember Jeremiah has also lived uh, either pre-exilic or during the exile, prophesied right around that time period. Um, but at the same time, there's a greater exodus that's kind of coming down the road where God still has to deliver Israel from the um, oppression of all the wickedness that's around her in the future. So we'll begin to uh, unpack that next week, but that'll do it for eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week. Uh, my name is Arubin Lyman Hanavi. I'm a member of the Harvest Congregation, a real live congregation in Thornton, Colorado. You can find us online at graftedin.com. We'd love to have you join us live in person at our synagogue services week after week. But if you're still just a little bit uncomfortable getting out and about, at least find us online and uh, follow our YouTube channel and watch the videos like you can see on my screen right now. You're also um, invited 
to head on over to tatesatora.com. That's my own personal tour teaching website. T e t z e t o r a h dot com is the uh, URL address. If you'd like to bookmark it in your browser, um, you can see a cluster of links there to different studies that I've put together. This is not the exhaustive list, but it's just kind of the core list that I draw from. And so um, have a look around, and um, if you like what you're um, reading, um, be sure to investigate a little bit further because a lot of what I write turns into either a YouTube video or an iTunes podcast or something to that effect. Speaking of YouTube videos, find me on the YouTube platform at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Tate Tour Ministries, all one word there, C for channel. And you'll notice right away that you'll see that I update my channel daily. I'm typically uploading a video like a short five minute video on the topic uh, every day twice a day sometimes and uh, even twice on the weekends or something like that I try to keep fairly busy um, make sure that you uh, browse around through all the um, uh, channels and videos and playlists that I do make available on my website and for those of you in post-production you can see that I've got a bunch of uh, um, suggestions dancing around the screen subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, hit the bell for notifications leave me comments uh, or questions or corrections hit the thumbs up if you like what you're watching and make sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles some important details uh, that if you'd like to join us for our live studies is get access to Skype somehow on whatever device that you're using, smartphone or smartwatch or uh, desktop or laptop or iPad or um, you know Android device or whatever. Um, get access to Skype and um, that's the platform that we use uh, week after week. In fact, if you click on the blue Skype link that you see on my screen right now, it'll launch Skype in your browser if you're using a desktop or laptop computer and uh, you don't have to do anything any, any other installing if that's what you'd like to do so we'd love to have you join us week after week uh, via Skype but if not um, if you are on my website sometime at tatesaytora.com take a moment to scroll down to the very very bottom to that black section where you can see some Hebrew writing and carefully pray about partner partnering with me during this difficult time that I'm still in it's been quite a long um, famine is what I'm calling it um, of uh, of um, employment um, where I'm still um, just kind of relying on uh, God's grace and favor to keep me uh, afloat uh, and that's accomplished through your um, gifts and contributions and, and prayers and support and uh, um, just uh, monies that are being sent in via the internet this is the mechanism right here click the little yellow donate button um, that shows up on my site here or in the each video I put a little link to this same um, uh, PayPal feature link as well as it shows up in my newsletters to give people an opportunity to help support me. Um, I'm so absolutely thankful and grateful to be on the receiving end of your generosity and I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you out there. Those of you who are regular givers, just absolutely um, so grateful. I can't express my gratitude enough at how um, how thankful I am and absolutely humbled uh, to be in a place where God's using you to bless me during this difficult time. So uh, please do continue to keep giving. Uh, those of you who are regular givers, those of you who just give me one-time gifts, that's fine as well too. I mean, uh, God uh, creates the increase. God knows the need. God creates the increase. Um, you guys are just on the on the uh, position of being used uh, by God uh, to bless me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. As I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn now to a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism and begin to look at these um, passages that are being presented by the Biblical Unitarian website, uh, biblicalunitarianism.com where they're disputing biblical, uh, biblical Unitarians are disputing passages that Trinitarians would argue are Trinitarian speaking verses and chapters, passages, but the Biblical Unitarian, which is a non-Trinitarian Christian group, says, no, there's no Trinity here. This is, There's just an assumption that is Trinity. Instead, if we go back and carefully peel back all the layers of understanding, it's actually a non-Trinitarian passage. And so it leaves a lot of Trinitarians scratching their heads going, 
wow, that seems plausible. That seems possible. That seems likely. Maybe I've misunderstood it all, these long, all along. Maybe God isn't Trinity. What we're trying to do is reclaim these verses for their Trinitarian understanding that I believe they firmly are, that God truly is Trinity. I am a Trinitarian myself. You might call me, call me Orthodox Trinitarian in the sense the word Orthodox reserve, it points back to original Trinitarian, not like, say, maybe a, a Neo-Trinitarian or one of these later versions of Trinity that has a kind of a, a kind of a skewed view of Trinity where there's uh, three persons, but they're not all deity or um, three masks, but there's only one God or some other kind of weird version, odd version of Trinity, uh, a Jesus who's a creature, something like that. No, um, Orthodox Trinitarian, meaning it's rooted in, uh, if I want to borrow the name biblical, like Unitarian is, I call myself a biblical Trinitarian. So I'm not a biblical Unitarian. I'm a biblical Trinitarian. So what we left off is last week, and I'll try to finish this up this week, is we're looking at um, Genesis 16, 7 through 13, which is the first um, passage that talks about this figure known as the angel of the Lord. And last week and week two weeks prior, and I'll try to finish it this week, is we looked at this idea of angel of the Lord through the biblical Unitarian list. And while they're trying to describe the angel of the Lord as some sort of agency or someone other than God. And what we're ascertaining as we're going to look through more um, um, theophany and Christophany language tonight is that context really determines whether we understand that the angel Lord is actually a manifestation of very God himself in, 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 in almost like I said, a theophany is a, a manifestation of the otherwise transcendent God, but in a, in an eminent fashion, these two words that I play with a lot, transcendence and eminence describes this kind of paradox between the the concept that God is so far away from us and so high and lofty and removed in his holiness and in his majesty and his um, magnificence that we can't, we can't even understand him because it's beyond our understanding. That's what I mean by transcendence. I'll put a little graphic on the screen so you can see this. But at the same time, God is imminent. He's close up and personal. He, we can't understand him because he's brought himself close to us in the incarnation, in the very person of Messiah Yeshua. We see God dwelling with us and God interacting with us in the eminence and the person of Messiah. So when we talk about the angel of the Lord, we're going to see those themes uh, going back and forth as well. Is the angel of the Lord the, the transcendent God, but in material form and in, in, in manifestation? Or is it simply some angel that we can interact with that's a little less powerful, in fact, way less powerful than God, obviously, uh, but is nevertheless a created being, um, more powerful than humans, uh, but not almighty God? So those are the questions that we're entertaining as we're looking at these um, views. We looked last week at two uh, um, common Christian views, uh, gotquestions.org. <coughs> Um, and the uh, another web blog where it talked about the classic view of the angel Lord as being a prefigured Messiah. But let's turn now to Tim Haig, one of my favorite authors, and let him talk about this primary question, uh, questions in the formations of Trinity doctrine as, doctrine as it uh, pertains to um, theophanies, which are manifestations of God, or Christophanies, which are manifestations of the pre-incarnate Messiah, or even we have angelophanies uh, and things like that, or theosophanies. These are all kind of technical words that you'll encounter if you ever attend seminary. All right, so here's let me just jump through Tim Haig's uh, commentary here. There's a, one, a half a page, then a full page, then another half a page. So it's not long reading. And then from there, just kind of telling you in advance what I'm going to do, I'm going to begin to look at some um, passages. There's the Genesis 16 passage with Sarah, with um, uh, Hagar and the angel of the Lord. We'll maybe look at some, if we have time, we'll look at some of the Hebrew uh, we might begin to talk about um, Genesis 22, uh, where the angel Lord shows up talking with Abraham, and work our way towards um, some references, Genesis 31, where we have another uh, encounter with the angel Lord, uh, this time with Jacob. And what we might begin to do, Genesis 48 with uh, Jacob, and again talking about the angel Lord, what we might begin to do is work our way towards this idea that the Bible is prepping us using all of these um, encounters prepping us for the actual incarnation which would hit the scene eventually and so that's why if you look at these all these references uh with the angel of the lord and things like that they were working our way towards the um uh the new testament passages that actually um now have um 
Yeshua showing up and doing things or using language that reminds us of uh, the angel of the Lord acting on God's behalf, kind of in agency fashion, but um, sometimes just uh, speaking first person as God. And so uh, in the end, um, let me see, yeah, even angelology. In the end, uh, we're, we're, we're left with a biblical view of a figure that in the Old Testament sometimes is very God and other times is an angel. It depends on the context. But either way, the language of both of those uh, occurrences, whether it's God or whether it's an angel, they both prepare us for the incarnation uh, where we meet Yeshua, who is on the one hand very God and on the other hand fully man, right? The dual nature of Yeshua himself. He is both truly God and truly man. And so I'm kind of spoiling it for you up front in case you get lost in the tree because of the trees. The, the spoiler is that the angel of the Lord is supposed to prep the reader for the understanding that it is God and it's less than God. It's, it's, he's fully God and he's a created being, right? Like Yeshua, he's Jesus as a, as a man, he's created, but as uh, meaning, I mean, it's a supernatural birth, but nevertheless, he's still a human. All right, his flesh is humanity, but at the same time, in his nature, he's fully God. So that's kind of where we're going. I'm spoiling it for you up front. Sorry for those of you who are, oh, Ariel, you spoiled the movie. Okay, sorry. All right, let me read quickly through uh, Tim Hague's notes here. I'll try to read without stopping, and then I'll go back and comment afterwards. Tim Hague has this to say, quote, this is from his seminary level um, study on... Um, on uh, 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 theology proper. It's a seminary level uh, class that you can purchase from his website, uh, torresource.com. Tim says, if we were to reduce the long and arduous Trinitarian debates that took place in the early centuries of the emerging Christian church, the most to the most fundamental questions, they would be the following. Number one, and I think he has just two or three questions. Number one, are the forms in which God reveals himself to mankind merely extensions of himself or do these forms exist as separate entities? All right, so we're going to read down through this. He continues, Are the various forms in which God reveals himself analogous to various forms of communication? For example, a person might make himself himself or herself known to others through letters, literature, stories, pictures, art, etc. But these are not distinct entities, but rather are means of expressing one's thoughts, self-descriptions, actions, etc., Thus, for example, God revealed himself to people in the form of the angel of the Lord. Question, was the angel of the Lord a temporary extension of God himself, or did he exist and possibly still exists as distinct from God as an individual being? Tim continues, that same question then was asked about Yeshua. Is Yeshua simply a projection of God himself, or does Yeshua exist as distinct from the God who sent him? He continues, the manner in which this question was asked, remember, he's talking about the first century, early um, church father, uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth century uh, debates and, and uh, discussions and councils, trying to figure out who and what Yeshua is. All right. Um, uh, the manner in which this question was asked centered in the Greek word um, hypostasis, or uh, hypostasis, meaning substantial nature, essence, actual being, reality, right? Um, which from where we get the Greek, the English word hypostasis, I believe. So hypostasis. Did the forms, quote unquote, by which God revealed himself have their own nature, their hypostasis, or were they actually simply shadows of the divine nature projected into the world? Let's keep reading Tim. The same question was directed primarily to the issue of the nature of Yeshua, and particularly the issue of his dual nature, his humanity and his deity. In Let me interject for just for a brief moment, I, I promise I won't wax long in my interjection. As I begin to interact with uh, biblical Unitarians in particular, I'm often reminded that many of their objections to Trinity are more or less... Um, centered in a in a misunderstanding of the incarnation of the dual nature of Jesus being both truly God and truly man like we trinitarians affirm and so as is so often the case with biblical trinitarians I'm sorry biblical unitarians 
they often find themselves torn between um, embracing a Jesus who's truly God or a, embracing a Jesus who's truly man. And so in an effort to distance themselves from biblical Trinitarians, they simply opt for God being fully God and Jesus being fully man. They go into that direction and they solve the tension created by the paradox of this dual nature of Yeshua. Okay, so that's what Tim Head's going to begin to talk about. And I myself recognize that this is a common... I, I'm using the word struggle when I'm when I'm describing biblical Unitarians, even though they wouldn't say they're struggling, they would say that they've decided the matter for themselves. But in reality, the whole um, denomination of biblical Unitarianism represents the struggle uh, of the dual nature of Messiah. It represents that because of uh, they're still holding to a Bible that otherwise in other places describes Jesus in more than human terms. And so they have to wrestle through what's known as the paradox. And that's why I'd say it's a struggle. All right. Um, Tim says, this same question was directed primarily to the issue of the nature of Yeshua, his dual nature, humanity, and his deity. How were these united in the one person of the Messiah? The controversy centered on the same Greek term, the hypostasis. We find this word in Hebrews 1.3, speaking of Yeshua, quote, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, hypostasis. And, continuing, upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Hebrews 1.3. Okay, so what's the writer saying? This verse Tim, Tim in, uh, interprets <clears throat> and explains. This verse, this verse speaks of Yeshua as, quote, the exact representation of his nature, end quote, right? The character tes hypostasios autu, which implies a distinct entity while at the same time being a perfect and complete revelation of God's nature, right? The hypostasis, um, which is what the Greek is trying to explain, right? That when it talked about the, the character, the word from where we get the, the English word, the character, character tes Hypostaseus out to the 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 um the nature of him, literally the the character, uh, character the nature of him is literally how the Greek would be translated. Tim talks about how it was this Greek word hypostasis uh, hypostasis that gave rise to the concept of the hypostatic union. In fact, you can hear it in the Greek. Uh, hypostasis and hypostatic, a phrase describing the union of Yeshua's humanity and deity in one nature. So when I say dual nature, I mean one nature unified by the dual natures of both full deity and or truly deity and truly human. Um, that is affirming the hypostatic union. The Christian church dismissed the teaching that Yeshua was human in his body and only divine in his spirit, but that the two did not mix, right? That's a heresy that Orthodox Christianity had to deal with very, very early on, the, the idea that Yeshua is split somehow. Likewise, the opposite view, which is again a heretical view, was also overturned by the doctrine of the hypostatic union, namely that Yeshua was neither really human nor divine, but that his human body and his divine spirit mixed to form an entirely unique nature. So notice the two ditches that um, historic Christianity sought to avoid, right? A, a ditch on one side that made Yeshua into some... Um, uh, quasi-human but fully divine or on the other side he's fully human and doesn't have any divinity at all uh or some strange mixture of his divinity and his and his humanity so it's a it's a it's a it's a paradox of course how can he be fully human and fully divine how can he be truly human and truly divine at the same time right it seems like the, the the math doesn't add up which is what uh, biblical Unitarians like to showcase a lot. They try to say, well, it doesn't make any sense, right? And of course, we talked about how that this is an argument from their perspective, how that if Trinity were truly um, accurate, then this is the way the, the, the um, Bible should be arguing, or this is the language that we should find. And so they're arguing from their own um, perspective of what they think the Bible should look like if indeed Trinity were true. Instead of allowing the Bible to describe Trinity using language that is somewhat challenging because of the information limitation, because of the slight ambiguity and, and um, 
uh, um, what we might call um, uh, figures of speech that don't seem to always uh, paint the, to the total picture for us, even though it's a complete picture from God's perspective. So ambiguous or uh, equivocal or something to that effect. Tim continues, the obvious difficulties with this perspective is that the Bible simply does not speak in this way, right? When we're talking about... <clears throat> understanding who Yeshua is. Yeshua instead is portrayed as fully human. He is born as a baby, grows and matures, experiences human emotions, gets tired, hungry and thirsty, dies and resurrects. He prays to the Father in the same manner as he teaches his disciples to pray, and in every way lives and dies as a common human being. At the same time, it is clear from his own teaching and that of his apostles that he existed with the Father from eternity, that he received the worship of others, that he has returned to the Father where he dwells in the glory he had before the world began, and that he is coming again to receive the worship of all mankind. So Tim is just reminding us that if we give the Bible its due credit, if we practice sola scriptura and tota scriptura, like Dr. James White is fond of reminding us, that is, we're giving the Bible its total allegiance and allowance for its full weight of authority, and we're at the end of the day coming only back to the Bible instead of extra biblical resources like, like some people like to lean on, then what we find is that the Yeshua of the Bible is truly human and he's truly divine. That's the point um, that um, is being brought up by Tim. Number two, question that Tim brings up that reminiscent of the early church father's um, issues. Are the forms in which God reveals himself to mankind special modes of his self-revelation? That is, has God chosen a number of forms in which he presents himself to mankind? And is Yeshua the most significant one of these modes? We're having this discussion about the angel of the Lord in Genesis chapter 16. Biblical Unitarianism wants us to believe that the angel of the Lord is not the Lord himself, at least not truly and fully deity like God is. Rather, the angel of the Lord is a special, unique angel who is um, so special and recognized by God that he can speak as the agent of the Lord and even speak for God and as God in first person, leaving humans to with the wrong impression that he truly is God. But at the end of the day, he's truly only a created uh, creature. He's a, he's a special creature, but he's an angel. And therefore, he cannot be Yeshua because Yeshua is merely a human. That's their perspective. I disagree with um, the finality and the final conclusion of their perspective, but I have to agree with some of the um, details that that lead to their conclusion because the Bible is the, the same source of information that they're using as the same source that I'm using, which is the Bible. Although, although remember, I, I, I uh, remind you that they bring in this idea of agency or, and they run with it quite too far. I'll talk about agency when I bring the study to a close. If I do it tonight, that's great. If I don't do it tonight, we'll stretch this out to one more week, but I'm trying not to belabor the point, but it is a, it is a, um, it is a foundational principle that biblical Unitarians fall back to over and over again, this idea of agency in the Bible, that the agent is to be regarded as the principle in terms of authority. And so if the principle is God and the agent is a messenger, then the messenger can speak in first person as God, and the people that he's speaking to must regard the message as if it was being spoken by the very mouth of God. And so based on this principle, on this this um, logic of principle and agent, right, a king and his messenger, then Jesus doesn't have to be very God when he talks about, when he uses language of creation or when the Bible writers talk about Jesus being the creator and things like that. Rather, they're simply using agency language and they're giving Jesus the lesser role of being an agent. It's kind of like the heresy known as the greater and lesser Yahweh that Rabbi uh, Moshe Koniukowski talks about um, uh, prominently in his writings, right? The le greater and lesser Yahweh. You just do a Google search for that. Greater and lesser YHVH or YHWH. I can't remember if Koniukowski uses. And Koniukowski, uh, Kony his name's a tongue twister. Kony o o Kony Okowski, I believe it's Kony O, not Kony U, but it might be Kony U. I need to look it up again. Rabbi Kony Okowski, Kony Okowski, one of the two. Um, Moshe is his first name. He uh, claims to be a Messianic Jew, so that's what makes things all the more uh, perturbing and disturbing. But this idea of a greater and lesser Yahweh is kind of running with the agency uh, concept to an absurd extreme, um, to where Yeshua is never given uh, the recognition of being deity or God. He's re relegated to the creature status, uh, non-creator status, um, 
uh, just because of the language that talks about the human humanity side of his existence. Um, let's continue with Tim and finish this tonight. Another idea that was offered by some of the debaters of by some of the debates over the nature of God's being was that the invisible God who is pure spirit takes on different modes or physicality in order to reveal himself in time and space to mankind. This is kind of where the oneness Pentecostal movement oneness Pentecostal denomination picks up their idea of modalism, even though they don't call it modalism, the category belongs to the modalistic category. And so that's what um, Tim's going to describe here. In case you're not familiar with it, you're now going to get a miniature treatment. These modes could be include, um, could include bright light, like the Shekhinah or Shekinah, a pillar of cloud, fire, an angel, and ultimately Yeshua. Uh, in this way, each of the modes has no being or existence distinct from God, but is simply the garments in which God clothes himself in order to become visible to mankind, so to say, right? Remember, God is invisible and he can't be seen. In this manner of thinking, Yeshua, though being the most perfect and final representation of God, is neither eternal nor distinct from the Father. Like a change of clothes, each of the modes are simply God's desired method to reveal himself in visible form. Him continues, The obvious problem with this explanation is that it does not coincide with the language of the Bible. Again, we're going to have to go back to this over and over again. When you hear some non-Trinitarian telling you that, well, Jesus is not the creator, Jesus is merely a human, and they use the word merely there for, for um, effect or for emphasis, or Jesus is just the agent of God, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Jesus is a creature. This doesn't comport with the language of the Bible in its context. You might find a cherry-picked verse or passage that seems to be indicating that that's all that Jesus is, but in the greater scope of either the context of the passage or the greater scope of the context of the book or the greater scope of the context of Scripture when comparing Scripture against Scripture, right? Tanakh versus Apostolic Scriptures, Old Testament versus New Testament, then that cannot be the case. We have to allow all of Scripture to speak to the matter. And that's what Tim's reminding us, and that's what I'm going to remind you over and over again as a biblical Trinitarian. For in the scriptures, we read about God sending the Son, the Son submitting to the Father, and the Son praying, not my will but yours be done, reference from Luke 22. It further seemed to dismiss the picture offered by Daniel chapter 7, which Yeshua applied to himself, that he would be sitting on the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven in the eschaton, right? Matthew 26. We referenced that in our... Um, uh, um, our eschatology study earlier where we talked about Yeshua as the Son of Man seen, seen by Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 approaching the Ancient of Days and receiving this kingdom, right? Yeshua has to receive this kingdom in order for God to have his righteous place where he belongs and in order for Yeshua to receive the, the inheritance from his Father. Tim continues, such language seems clearly to describe Yeshua as being distinct from the Father, something the idea of modal modalities could not ac accommodate. Him continues, in addition to the important hypostasis used to designate the concept of nature, and particularly the distinct nature of the plurality within the Godhead, the early church fathers chose the Greek word ousia, meaning that which exists and therefore has substance, property, wealth, right? So we've got these two Greek words that are helping us to try and uh, unpack all that Yeshua represents for us by uh, the somewhat challenging language that the Bible lays down for us. Although it's authoritative, it's still nevertheless a challenging. Uh, Tim continues, by property, when we're talking about usia, the Greek word, is meant essential qualities, which is also what the word substance means. When we're talking about God's substance, right? We're, we're having a, an ontological discussion. What is the substance of God? What's he made of, right? What's his composition? How, what are the sum of his parts? How can we understand that? So Tim talks about substance, which means for this term, this term seeks to describe the essential reality of that being described. Thus, when we encounter the word substance in the Trinitarian debates, right? We're talking about the church fathers and the language that shows up in the um, uh, all the creeds and things like that. Um, when we encounter this word substance in the Trinitarian debates of the early centuries, we should not think that this implies much materialism or physicality when we're talking about God. For the word usia will be used of the Father and the Spirit as well as of the Son. We're talking about how do we describe the substance of something which is, which is non-corporeal. 
a spirit, right? God is pure spirit. The Holy Spirit is pure spirit, except for when we're talking about theophanies and uh, um, and 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 the like. Um, you know, the spirit looking like a dove and things like that. What's the material aspect of something which is otherwise altogether immaterial? That's what we mean by those statements. And Tim concludes by saying, we will see then that the two questions offered above and the subset of questions they generate, right, questions one and two, form the primary focus of controversy in the late second centuries and onwards, controversies that eventually led to the formulation of the Orthodox Christian Trinitarian creeds. Moreover, we will see that the Orthodox formulation sought to substantiate one usia in three hypostases, right? And that's really the conclusion of where this discussion is going, not just from the early centuries perspective, but has carried along down with us down to this day. How can God have this substance that is found in all three persons all at the same time? And yet Yeshua is <clears throat> one of those persons who exists with a substance that is equal to mine, right? Yeshua was fully human, and I'm fully human. And yet Yeshua is now more than human, and I'm not yet, right? Yeshua has been transformed. He now has his resurrected body, and I'm still awaiting mine. But when he walked the earth before the resurrection, he was as human as I am. Although he had a nature that was fully divine, that I can't quite fully comprehend how they could uh, be um, uh, joined together in the hypostatic union there. So that really is the, the, the bottom line for us as biblical Unitarians and Trinitarians dealing with um, the angel of the Lord prophecies, the angel of the Lord encounters. So I'm going to kind of accelerate this and perhaps maybe just draw this to a close tonight. As we begin to look at the angel of the Lord, maybe in other passages, and we certainly should, um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, biblical Unitarianism does it for us. If they don't, just be aware that, that we started out in Genesis 16 with Hagar and the angel of the Lord. You can see on my screen, um, if I scroll down into the, um, uh, uh, the, to the story, starting in verse 7, now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water. But quickly, as we begin to keep going through the biblical narratives, and we'll get to this in time, we surely must, I'm certain that they do, we're going to encounter passages like Genesis 22. Um, well, uh, even before that, we get Genesis 18, where God and and three and two angels show up and start chatting with Abraham. I don't have this in my uh, uh, on my screen right now, but but you're aware of it as a Bible student, where it's not the angel of the Lord language, but it's God in theophany form talking with Abraham, uh, and yet it looks like three men to Abraham, and the, but one of the figures is definitely God. It's Yahweh, right? So. But as we look at angel of the Lord language, right, that specific phrase in the, in the uh, Hebrew, Malach Adonai, uh, then we can jump all the way to Genesis 22. came about after these things that God tested Abraham, and, and Abraham said, here am I. Take your son, your only son whom you love. And then the language quickly switches over to the angel of the Lord that Abraham um, uh, dialogues with uh, on the mountain there. And, so, and the angel even says, now I know that you... Um, in verse 11, the angel Lord said, Abraham, Abraham, and he says, here I am. Even Abraham's response is identical to God, uh, to the angel, here I am, right? Um, Don't stretch out your hand against the lad, do nothing, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from him. No, that's not what the text says. It says, not withheld your only son from me, but it's the angel of the Lord. And this this particular um, example that we're going to get to in time is quite unique because in one breath, in one sentence, in one statement, this figure of the angel of the Lord speaks in first person as God and third person uh, referring to God in both in, in one statement, right? He says, don't stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now, I know that you fear God, third person, <laughs> since you haven't withheld your only son from me, first person, right? In one breath. I mean, this has got to really throw a monkey wrench in the argument and logic of the biblical Unitarians who say that, no, the angel of the Lord is only an angel. He speaks as God and for God because he's an agent, right? Well, wait a minute. What about this one? This one, I know they're going to explain it in their own way, weird way uh, when we get to it, but I'm just going to kind of give you advance notice. But in the end, really context determines there are some passages that are clearly um describing the angel of the lord in a role that is um 
a manifestation of God himself. Um, and it's unmistakable from his words and his actions that we're, we're dealing with a theophany um, or language very closely describing what would be uh, classified as a, a theophany. Um, even though it uses the word angel there, it's just, remember, the word angel is more of a um, functional word. It's more of a tool um, to describe messenger. It describes function. It doesn't really describe identity per se. The word messenger, the word angel, uh, you know, um, malach in the Hebrew, I'll flash a little graphic on the screen and post for you to see this. The word, the Hebrew word for angel, malach, when we get the English word angel or the Greek word angelos, is related to the English word messenger, um, uh, which is also related to the Greek word um, apostolos, from which we get the English word apostle. And so all of these words, angel, messenger, um, apostle, they all are, are um, functional words. They're not really describing necessarily the identity of a person so much as they're simply describing the title. I'm sorry, they're describing the, the function uh, that a person is playing at any given time in a narrative. Um, so uh, it's a tool. So don't get get confused when God's the, 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 theophany as a messenger is described as an angel, where God himself is described as an angel, right? Doesn't doesn't mean that God is an angel, it's just the word angel there is translated as messenger. It doesn't mean angel as in the angelic being, it just means a messenger in that regard. But there are other cases, and I'm trying not to confuse you, but I have to at least explain this part. There are other cases in the Bible, and we looked at these last week. Go back and listen to episode number 207 of my live internet studies. Um, watch the YouTube video. Uh, there are other cases where the Bible is clearly describing an angel, and it uses the same Hebrew word, malach, or the Greek word, angelos, depending on if you're reading the Septuagint. And it's meant to inform us that it is a created creature, a messenger, someone sent by God. It is not God in manifest form as in theophany. So all of these passages, whether it's the ones in Genesis or Exodus, the ones we read later on in the other prophets, as we jump through some of the Hebrew, and I'm kind of quickly kind of just rushing through some of this because I feel like I'm kind of belaboring the point. I think most of you are getting this. Joshua 5, uh, when we get down to the end of the chapter, uh, a man uh, stands in front of Joshua uh, starting at verse 13, and it's not the angel of the Lord, Dame. Instead, it's a figure known as the captain of the army of the Lord. But it's the same concept going on. Um, it's a it's a divine type figure, a very heavenly um, looking figure that is meant to give us this understanding of God is all powerful and divine, and yet manifests himself. Uh, in a way in which we can interact with them on a, uh, using one of our five senses, <clears throat> right? We see or we hear or we we dialogue with, and in many cases it short circuits our senses, right? Uh, I'm reminded of poor Daniel or even John at the, on the on the Isle of Patmos when um, when they have encounters with angelic beings, they're left shaking and sick for many days, like Daniel was, right? Sick to his very being. Um, or uh, Ezekiel, you know, they faint, they pass out, uh, they're undone, right? They their knees become weak and their 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 the bones give way and they just drop, right? They're like for that very moment they're just boneless, right? They don't have any, they can't stand, and so interacting with these these beings, um, or God Himself in 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 theophany form, uh, short circuits us as humans, not all the time, but many times. And so as we begin to look at these passages, whether it's the angel of the Lord or the captain of the uh, of the um, Lord's armies, um, these are all meant to give us a picture. Uh, notice in Malachi, behold, I'm sending my messenger. But if I click on the little A there, it tells me that this is actually angel. It, but every pro, every translation I've uh, looked at usually says, behold, I'm sending my messenger and he will clear away before me. But it's actually the word angel. And I wanted to bring that up for you because it's just the translators choose to decide whether it says messenger or angel there. It's talking about function. Um, but in this case, it's proper to understand that this is referring to Yeshua. But um, uh, because the context demands that that was going on. And the reason I brought Malachi in is because in closing... This is the book uh, that's the final book of the Old Testament from the Christian uh, ordering of the books of the Old Testament. And it's fitting that this 
um, chapter, which is near the end of the uh, book of Malachi, the letter to Malachi, begins describing this messenger that's going to come to Israel and come suddenly to his temple, the one that the Lord is sending and the one whom the people are seeking. And he's described as the Lord whom you are seeking, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. But notice the prophecy says, behold, I'm sending my messenger, right? And he will clear away before me. So God is speaking in the first verse, first person, and speaking of this messenger as in third person, and the Lord whom you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. What? Notice the language, how it, it, it smoothly transitions between first person and third person, between God and his messenger, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. Reminds me of the Zechariah passage when it says, um, you will look on him whom you whom you pierced and you will mourn from him, him as, you, as one mourns from an only son. You, you, they will look on me whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. This is reminiscent of the Genesis 22 passage where the angel of the Lord speaks in, uh, uh, just seamlessly of first person I as God and he as God at the same time, right? You, Me and I. And yet he, so the Bible, what is it doing? It's prepping us, at least this last chapter, last book of the Bible from the Christian rendering. I know in the Jewish reckoning, it's Second Chronicles. But either way, um, we're talking about prepping us for the time period of the coming of Messiah and the incarnation, the intertestamental period between the, uh, the Old and New Testament of your Bible, that time period when Trinity was revealed uh, fully to us as human beings. And so that's why in my notes here, I've got this transition, as it were, um, from the uh, prophecies and the, uh, the angel of the Lord into uh, the Malachi passages, and then suddenly moving into Mark. Um, Behold, I'm sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way. The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Notice, um, Mark records that we prepare the way for the messenger, Behold, I'm sending my messenger. That's God's vo voice. I'm sending my messenger before you. But then verse 3 says, The voice of one calling out in the windows, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Is it the Lord who we're preparing the way for? Wait a minute. I thought the Lord's saying I'm sending my messenger. So here we have a verse in Mark chapter 1 where God is speaking in first person saying, Behold, I'm sending my messenger. We just looked at, at, at that in Malachi. Behold, I'm sending my messenger. But then it's Isaiah's voice that says, The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Mark, by smashing these two, by making a, um, um, a, 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 a conflation of these two verses that are found, passages found in Malachi and in Isaiah, and in fact, he gives Isaiah the credit when he says, just as Isaiah said, uh, which is kind of an odd thing. But Mark is doing for us, he's showing us how the messenger of the Lord is also the Lord, right? Behold, I'm sending my messenger before you. That's God talking. That's the Lord talking. But in verse 3, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. It's the Lord who we're preparing the way for. So this is the culmination of our angel of the Lord passages where we find the angel of the Lord is the Lord, and yet the angel of the Lord is a messenger of the Lord. Understand? So it is both and. There's the tension created by the fact that some passages refer to the angel as the Lord himself, and other passages refer to the angel as a messenger of the Lord, a separate person from the Lord. Right? And from there... This is where I was going to go if I uh, draw this out another week or two. We find Luke uh, um, having the similar language. Let me see. Um, why did I bring Luke up? The messenger from God, uh, the messenger from the from John. Uh, this is Yeshua's recounting that the one that, that talked about um, uh, the one who's preparing the way uh, is John, who comes in the spirit of Elijah. Uh, in fact, um, uh, when we get down to Luke chapter seven verse um, twenty-seven, Yeshua asks him, "Who did you who did you go out into the desert to see?" Then Yeshua quotes the um, uh, the passage that we just read earlier. Behold, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who prepare your way before you. Right. Um, this quotation from the Isaiah 
passage is reminiscent of the Malachi passage because it talks about the messenger who's going to prepare your way. And then Yeshua gives us the interpretation. In verse 28, I say to you among those born of women, there's no one greater than John, yet no one, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's John that is the person who's the one that God would send, yet it's Isaiah who prophesies that this one who would come and um, is, this is the uh, spirit of Elijah that we're talking about as well. So um, Isaiah prophesying about the spirit of Elijah, of which John then is that one that Yeshua says uh, partially fulfills this this particular uh, prophecy. So we were going to go with that in direct in that direction, uh, but we're going to culminate in the New Testament passages where um, it talks about how that Christ is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Um, Christ is the one who is, let me scroll down in verse 9, it's a familiar passage for us Trinitarians. In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you've been made complete, and he is the head over every rule and authority. In him you were circumcised with the circumcision performed without hands. What's the point? Is the point by Paul here is that Messiah is the one who is the fullness, right? Let me go back to uh, uh, those verses there. Verse. Um, nine um in him all the fullness of deed dwells in bodily form so when we're talking about the angel it is it god or is it a messenger the answer is yes the angel of the lord embodies the fullness of all that god is in those moments when he is appearing before us but in some cases the old testament is simply trying to show us that it's god and in other instances it was clearly just an angel Likewise, Yeshua, and I'm saying this in closing, Yeshua is truly God and fully God because in him the fullness of deity dwells. What part is lacking there? For those of you who say that Yeshua is less than God, you've either obviously not read this verse or you're ignoring it or you've rejected it because your theology forces you to reject it. But I'm here to tell you that it's authoritative. The Bible tells us that Yeshua has the fullness of deity dwelling in him. That means nothing's lacking in Yeshua when it comes to the nature, right, those two, two, those two words again, hypostasis and usia, the usia of God dwells fully in Yeshua. The fullness of deity dwells in, in bodily form. This is the hypostatic union. This is the incarnation all over again. If we would just get it through our heads that Yeshua is fully God in incarnate form, that means he's truly God and truly man, we would solve the tension of all these angel of the Lord passages and the um, uh, arguments between biblical Unitarianism and biblical Trinitarianism would all melt away because we'd understand that we're dealing with a, a, um, a person who is fully God but is fully man. Even though it creates tension, it nevertheless is the only way to truly harmonize all of the scriptures that are brought up in discussions when we're having this um, dialogue between uh, is God Trinity or is he not? But I think what I'll do is I'll leave off right there. We'll stop right there. I was going to bring in a, uh, a resource on angelology from the um, Talmudic, from a, a biblical Talmudic and post-Talmudic Jewish encyclopedia resource where they talk about angelology. And if I scroll down a little bit, maybe I will read just a little bit of this. Under the title of Nomenclature and Essence, this is a resource from a non-Christian perspective. They have this uh, um, little discussion where they talk about the angel of the Lord and they um, begin to talk about how that um, this angel of the Lord figure, let me see if I can find all the references. Um, the angel of the Lord is a special messenger um, who appeared to Moses in the flame. And they're not going to say um, that this is a pre-incarnate Yeshua, obviously. But what they are going to say is that at times the angel clearly distinguishes himself from the Lord who sends him. And uh, though appearing in human form, uh, he, he, he has no individuality. Um, and so they show you uh, references, and they talk about that being only a temporary manifestation of God, he can never replace his presence. Wherefore, Moses, not satisfied with the Lord, saying, I will send an angel before thee, replies, If thy presence will not go, face, uh, go not with me, carry us, us, us not up hence. And so the big point that I was going to bring out there. Um, is that uh, they talk about that, how that uh, the angel of the Lord is God appearing in human form. Uh, he has no individuality in and of himself. So they're leaning more on the side of that the angel of the Lord is representing um, 
uh, a, um, an interaction with God on a, on a tangible level so that we humans uh, can uh, interact with God. But at times, the angel clearly just distinguishes himself from the Lord. So they're, they're recognizing, they're, they're, they're saying the same thing that all three of us, we biblical Unitarians, we biblical Trinitarians, and then uh, rabbinic Judaism, we're all recognizing that the angel of the Lord is sometimes very God manifest in a theophany way, and at other times it's the angel separate from God, the angelic being, and yet uses the phrase uh, angel of the Lord in, in both of those cases. We just have to let context decide. But we'll draw this part of our study to a close. I think most of you get the idea. That'll do it for a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. Let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name. And I'm so um, thankful for uh, what you're showing me and revealing to me through the pages of your word. Over and over again, whenever I open up your word, I'm just amazed and 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 just um, um, dumbfounded sometimes at, at your wisdom. And how you can, I can find new things over and over again as I as I uh, dig deeper and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal things to me. It, it's, I mean, it just doesn't get old. I can I can read certain passages over and over again and find more and more things that I didn't see the first time, and just appreciate the depth of your wisdom and um, uh, the mag- magnitude of your um, of glory and mag- and magnificence. Um, as is recorded for us in the pages of your, of your scriptures of your word. Thank you, Lord, for this 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 uh, gift to us, your very love letter to humanity and to your people. Thank you for uh, preserving your word by your spirit and empowering the spirit, empowering us to uh, walk it out by the spirit. Uh, continue to help us uh, to be a people that are pleasing to you, uh, turning from sin and turning to righteousness, um, being a blessing and being blessed in the process. Uh, continue to raise us up and protect us and, and to provide for us in these last and evil days. And we'd be careful to give you the praise and the glory, Bashim Yeshua. Amen.